election on the 8th, mm -hmm. the to order in Pakistan. So there's a lot of excitement about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit. I can go ahead and give an introduction and then I can hand it over yes, yes. to our illustrious um, speakers today. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Shannon Hader. I'm the Dean of the School of International Service. Um, and welcome. We are thrilled to have you here. This is part of our series on um, the Global Elections Initiative. So earlier this year, really at the beginning of this year, we started a new initiative, the Global Elections Initiative, and it comes with a Global Elections Tractor that's on our webpage. Because we see a few things at American University being here in D.C., we see anytime there is a U.S. presidential election cycle, suddenly there is broader interest in elections um, beyond folks who are focused on elections all the time, as many people in this room are. Um, and of course, at SIS, we very much know that, you know, how goes the world is about way more than just the U.S. presidential elections. So we said, let's use and cultivate some of that momentum that we sometimes see come up in a presidential election cycle and use it to really highlight many of the important critical national level elections that are happening across the world over this next two, two years, 18 months. Um, and importantly, allow us to leverage the extremely, extremely deep expertise, both in countries and context and in politics and democracy and elections that we have across our faculty and their colleagues that they collaborate with. Um, previously this year, we had uh, a session on the Argentinian elections, and literally we had it within, I think, 10 days before the election, and then we had the election happen, and you could say, okay, what, what predictions did we say pl see play out in the elections? Um, we did some uh, articles on the Taiwan elections, um, which have recently happened, and again, we're sort of going to be seeing how all that plays out on the regional and global geopolitical scene. Um, and so it is really thrilling today for us to be able to put the spotlight on Pakistan at a timely time during this very exciting and very important elections. Um, I'll say stay tuned. Um, look out. Um, later this spring, we're going to be doing an event on um, disinformation specifically in the electoral process uh, next month. And in April, we'll also do a session that spotlights the upcoming election in India. So we really are moving sort of around the world and picking up different topics as we go. Um, with today's spotlight on Pakistan, um, our expert speakers are really um, going to help us in discussing and sort of laying bare some of the challenges of implementing democracy, um, which I think we know we can take for granted nowhere. Um, and it is hardly a smooth route anywhere in the world. So understanding the specifics and the dynamics of what's going on in Pakistan now, how that relates to history, um, it's really just a fascinating topic. Um, we have the luxury of having Ambassador Akbar Ahmed as our SIS professor, our Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at AU, uh, Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. Uh, professor Akbar's career has included posts in both academia and public service, including non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, um, the first distinguished chair of Middle East and Islamic Studies at the U.S. Naval Academy, um, the Iqbal Fellow, the Chair of Pakistan Studies um, and Fellow at Selwyn College, uh, University of Cambridge, and teaching positions at Harvard at Prist and Princeton. Um, Professor Akbar has dedicated more than three decades to the civil service in Pakistan as well. So I think from the inside, you have a lot of insights to offer as well. Um, it is just a privilege to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Mawaid uh, Hussein Shah, who is an attorney at law, author, member of the District of Columbia Bar, uh, member of the Lahore High Court Bar, and the U.S. Supreme Court Bar. Um, he served as counsel to the late U.S. Center, uh, Senator James uh, Abarek, and he was the minister in the Punjab cabinet in Lahore and the special assistant to the chief minister of Punjab and during 2004 served as the advisor to the Prime Minister of Pakistan. He is also an original co-founder of the PTI, one of the three major political parties that have ruled Pakistan 
And so I think, again, uh, insights both from a broad strategic level, but also I think as a real logistical stand up, build and strategic level, I'm sure as well. So um, welcome to our guests and especially uh, welcome to the audience and over to you, Professor Akbar. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Let me take advantage of the rostrum. Thank you so much, uh, Pineda. Thank you for this initiative. I think as much as we can emphasize elections, democracy, it will still not be enough in the world we are living in. So thank you for this initiative. Thank you, Honorable Mohit Shah, for coming and joining us, giving us your insights. Thank you all. Small in number, but it will grow hopefully very quickly. And thank you, most importantly, to Alice for being such an efficient and sympathetic organizer of this event. So as the Dean has pointed out, we are on this, this particular date at the threshold of the elections in Pakistan. Literally, the elections are taking place day after tomorrow. There's a lot of interest worldwide on this particular election because of the importance of Pakistan. And I want everyone to understand why this election is important. Elections are important in every country. The biggest democracy in the world, India. Election is going to be happening very soon. Oldest democracy in the world, the United States. Election is going to be happening. So elections are important. But why particularly Pakistan? And how does it relate to us in the United States? That is why this session is focused on Pakistan as a case study. And some of the issues that we will raise this morning also overlap with democracy elsewhere uh, in the global south. So I'm giving the big picture in terms of democracy in the global south, but the challenges are common. The challenges of corruption, nepotism, the difference in income between the very rich and the very poor, the breakdown of law and order, and the constant challenge to politics, to normal politics, with all the interference and violence and so on. And then for me, the sign of hope, and which really gives me encouragement and hope, the determination to have elections in spite of everything. Even in Pakistan, in the midst of so much going on, we will discuss this and better person than why um, to tell us it because he's lived to it. We have parties in conflict. We have the usual tension between the establishment, which means the military and the government and the political parties and the juggling for patronage, which will the establishment support? Party A or party B or party C? That is a big question in Pakistan, which creates the impression among Pakistanis that it is more a selection than an election. Pakistanis would say this, oh, it's not an election, it's a selection. And hovering above, above all this is the charismatic figure, I would even say the enigmatic and charismatic figure of Pakistan's superhero. He's, he, he's a genuine hero by any definition, that's Imran Khan. I'm not talking politically. I'm not politically inclined. I, I haven't joined any political party in uh, Pakistan's history ever. But as a historian, as an academic, a scholar of politics and culture, Imran is a hero, especially in the Pakistani context. This man won the World Cup in cricket. He created the first cancer hospital. He's been the head of Western universities, not only Pakistan universities, and so on. So the people of Pakistan, rightly or wrongly, tend to look up to him as this ideal figure. So he went in, he was arrested by the government, he went into jail as a superstar of cricket, a heroic figure, and he's beginning to emerge for the public as a Mandela figure. So already a lot of people are saying he's suffering, he's been in jail now for several months, and he's suffering with dignity. What will happen to him? There are all kinds of... Uh, stories that he may be done away with or he may be kept in jail for, for a very long time. So all this, these issues are up in the air. Uh, very intense feelings around him. Uh, all this will determine the outcome of the election because if they are free and fair elections, which the government is promising, 
And if he wins, his party wins, while he's in jail, it's going to put the government very sharply on the horns of a dilemma. And as you know from your metaphor in English, in the English language, you cannot be impaled on the horns of anything for very long. It's a painful situation to be in. So that's one of the big questions that I hope uh, Mohaid will enlighten us uh, on. And as the Dean has pointed out, Mohaid is not only an activist, he's also a writer, an intellectual, and a thinker. So he gives us a very uh, considered opinion on this. As Dean Hayes pointed out, I myself have been in Pakistan in service, and I have had the fortune of being a commissioner in the field, which means in charge of a civil division of Pakistan in three consecutive divisions and have conducted elections. So I know how difficult they are and how easily they can go off the rails and up the tracks. And you have to balance all kinds of things in order simply to hold elections. Because half of Pakistan's history has been under martial law. Keep that in mind. Half the history under martial law. So there's always the danger that Pakistan's democracy may just go off the rails. Everyone is very nervous about what could happen. Now, having introduced the subject of democracy, I believe that in today's world, we need to be looking at what's happening in any one country in the context of what's happening on the world stage. We have a genuine crisis with this issue of climate change. We cannot ignore it. We can't pretend it's only an academic subject for the young scholars to consider. It is happening right now in California. You've got mudslides and storms and so on. So there is a crisis of climate change. There is a crisis of violence. Look at the world map and see how many places. You look at the Middle East where it seems that something that the US does not want is happening, which is an extension of the war. So suddenly we have one, two, four, six, eight countries directly involved in a situation of some kind of war. And we ask ourselves, are we in the middle of a third world war? It's a huge question. So you've got climate change, but are we in the middle of a third world war? And wait a minute, I thought we were in confrontation with China. The, the fear was the Professor Mishima and the experts on politics saying that we are in the midst of a third world war between the US and China, but now we're talking about a different kind of world war. So these are questions which certainly to me as a as a, an observer of the world's uh, stage, very worrying. Now I am asking myself, do the people in charge know where we are going? Do they know what we want? Do they know how to get out of this situation and pull back from the brink? Because ultimately, if you want happiness for the world, prosperity, better living conditions, more harmony among people, this is not the route. We have to be thinking of these, these big questions. We also have to be thinking of democracy itself. Dean Heder, you remember Socrates warning us about democracy? He said democracy is the best form of government. But every citizen must be educated. He must know or she must know who they're voting for. Otherwise, democracy becomes a, a beast that is not controlled. It's out of control, an out of control beast. So the idea of democracy, yes, but a, a democracy that is informed and powered by educated citizens. Very important point to remember, especially for uh, the youngsters in the audience, the students. Now, Pakistan is, a, is really a good case study for this discussion because it has an inherent tension in it. Constantly, you'll see this tension. The people of Pakistan wanting democracy, wanting to assert their rights, wanting to participate in, the, in this world that we live in today, wanting to be part of the greater world. And at the same time, a pull towards a firmer, more authoritarian, more militaristic uh, aspect to administration, this constant tension. And that's why it constantly tilts over into martial law, which again and again, politicians will say, we do not want and we reject. And one of the things, as far as Imran is concerned, is precisely this. People see him as confronting the army and challenging it, uh, which again has created a situation which is extraordinary in terms of uh, Pakistani politics. Pakistan is also, it's good to remind ourselves, important because it is the first and so far only nuclear, uh, nuclear country. So all the Muslim world, and you have the map of the world and you have the Muslim world, 
Pakistan is the only country with a nuclear arsenal. And it is a sizable arsenal. Pakistan was the first country to have a female prime minister. So here's a hopeful sign. The first female prime minister was Pakistan. And there are many indications where Pakistan can and has excelled. At the same time, there are many problems which Pakistan has been wrestling with and not been able to fully resolve. Religious inclusivity, religious tolerance, inclusivity in terms of the communities that live in Pakistan, and unfortunately, they've been guaranteed their rights in the constitution. But unfortunately, in reality, very often, we see minorities being persecuted, very often driven out of the country. We have cases of Christians, Hindus, and so on happening in Pakistan. In spite of, I repeat this, the vision of Pakistan, which was established by the founder, Mr. Jinnah, which clearly states the inclusivity of the Pakistan vision. He actually specified it. Uh, and I think it's important to remember, because looking at Pakistan today, you, you may feel that it does not exist uh, in the vision of Pakistan, but it is very firmly the vision and the DNA of Pakistan. So with this in view, we need to understand the logistics in Pakistan itself in terms of elections. When I was commissioner in Quetta, which is the capital of Balochistan, which is a very important province of Pakistan, almost half the country, I used to have a habit as a fitter man there. I used to walk from the commissioner's house every afternoon up to the command and staff college of Pakistan, a very prestigious military college, very prestigious, world, world famous. So British soldiers, American soldiers, officers would go there for training. That's a distance of about five miles. Now I'm mentioning this because as I walked, I saw a fascinating sociological landscape beginning to change as I got nearer the command structure, the military st structure. The commissioner's house was surrounded by noise, chaos, tongas, horse-driven carriages, camel carts, everything uh, you can think of in terms of a lively, warm, chaotic scene. As we got closer to the command structure, the streets became cleaner. There were uh, trees on both sides, and women began to appear. So women, well-dressed, with their little kids often in their rams, taking them for a walk, unthinkable in the city. So you immediately saw, I saw as commissioner, the stark difference, and that made me think. It made me think that in the military establishment, obviously the government of Pakistan is poured in its resources. So officers are trained, they are even pampered, I would say, they're educated, they're they're used to and accustomed to a certain style of living. Whereas in the city, it's rough and good. That's how they're coping with life. And very often with, with severe shortage of resources. Keep this image in mind, the two contrasting images in Pakistan. And that raises the question, who is allocating the resources? Who's allocating the resources to the cake? Who's cutting the slices? And how big a slice is going to one part of Pakistan? How big is slice is going to the other, other part of Pakistan. Now I will end by pointing out the final importance of Pakistan, and that is its geopolitics. Pakistan's geopolitics is crucial for all of us to understand and keep in mind. It's what's called a rough neighborhood, situated in a rough neighborhood. All around you, you can see. In the midst of the crisis in the Middle East, Iran decided, and I'm still puzzled as why they did this, to suddenly launch a missile strike into Pakistan. And Pakistan, being Pakistan, immediately struck back. So Pakistan launched a missile strike into Iran. And suddenly in the midst of a crisis where you have Americans striking Iraq and Syria, last night they struck again, you suddenly have Iran and Pakistan in conflict. It's a nightmare scenario. You know, we're really talking about a very different kind of world situation. But luckily, good sense prevailed good sense prevailed, and both Pakistan and Iran quickly brought the relationship back to normal. And that's how I think mature nations must behave in this very tense environment. So that is the importance of Pakistan, the geopolitical situation. And Pakistan's desire, very strong desire, very explicitly stated of continuing to have good relations with the United States, which it has had since its inception. Mr. Jinnah, the founder, had to make a choice in 1947, 48. Do we opt as a new nation to go with America 
or go with the Soviet Union who was ruling Pakistan. And Jinnah decided to go with the United States for all kinds of democracy. He was a uh, the quintessential Democrat. And, and more or less, over the decades, that's how it's been. But simultaneously, Pakistan has very good relations with China. So it's a very difficult balancing act, China and America, especially when there's tension between the two. Or Pakistan can play the role of a bridge, which is how Pakistan likes to see itself as the classic bridge builder. Because you recall your story from 1972, it's like a straightforward international thriller. Kissinger flies into Islamabad. He said the curry was too hot, or he ate something which he shouldn't have eaten. So he's going to rest in bed for two or three in Islamabad. In the meantime, a Pakistan international airline flies him secretly into China, where he sets up the historic meeting between Nixon, President Nixon, Mao Xi, and Chun Lai. And that changes the shape of the global landscape. Literally, that shape changes the shape. So Pakistan is capable of playing a role uh, if it has the opportunity. And I think it constantly is looking for that kind of role. It's a hero in search of a role. I've given you one example. So that's another reason why Pakistan, remember what's around Pakistan, there's Afghanistan on one side. America cannot understand Afghanistan or deal with Pakistan without Pakistan. So Afghanistan as a crisis for America is not, America cannot handle it without Pakistan and has not been able to. Then there's India on the other side, Iran on one side, and there's China. It's a very difficult uh, situation. Therefore, uh, Pakistan and Pakistan's very strong commitment to democracy. All these things add up to tell us why Pakistan is important. And let me conclude my presentation. And we will uh, hear uh, Moaid, and after that, we'll have a QA, and and I want you to be involved in the QA. and uh, I do want to mention, I'll end by mentioning two or three books on Pakistan. There is Anatole Levine's book, Pakistan, a Hard Country. It's a very good academic, solid book. Uh, you won't mind my taking advantage of being at this rostrum mentioning two of my own books. There's Pakistan Society by Oxford University Press, print, printed by Oxford University Press, and Pakistan, Jinnah, Pakistan, and Islamic Identity, published by Routledge. So these are just uh, two books uh, uh, for your information. Now with that, may I request my friend, Mohit Shah, to come and present us his ideas. Thank you. Good morning. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Dean Shannon Heather. Irish name, I think, right? Yes. Shannon is Irish, I think. Shannon, yeah. Anyway, very sparkling introduction you gave, and I'm quite confident, having a brief glimpse of it, that the spark at CSIS under your tutelage will continue. May you flourish. And thank you for being here and for the hosting this. And Dr. Akbar, I want to thank him also. I think America owes him thanks. So does Washington, because he came here just a couple of weeks before 9-11. It was extremely difficult and challenging time. And he was, I think, a ray of civility, sobriety, and good sense, which he has maintained despite tremendous challenges. And he tried to be a healing force, inclusive force. And Zenith, his stalwart wife, has been a great presence despite challenges of her own. And she has been steadfast and has been a great spouse. And my own wife, Dana, she rarely comes to my events. And I feel very pleased that she's there. And thank you very much again. I think that uh, just a, a comment on democracy, what uh, Churchill is considered as one of the great paragons of democracy, but one of in one of his lighter moments, he said, if you want to disabuse yourself about the notion of democracy, have a conversation with an average voter. That's the best argument against democracy. That's what Churchill said privately, but he never, thank God, implemented it publicly. I see that 
in uh, Pakistan that uh, some of the issues Dr. Akbar has alluded to, nepotism and uh, corruption. I think that uh, in Pakistan, uh, the yes, there is uh, democracy, yes, there are elections, but somehow, sometimes, elections have not necessarily been a panacea. And in a sometimes in a divided polity, it further creates fragmentation and fact, factionalism. And Dr. Akbar Ahmed was there in East Pakistan, and the elections of 1970 precipitated the breakup of Pakistan. It created much greater polarization. It was not really thought out. Then seven years of that, there were elections of 1977, which led to the precipitated the hanging of Bhutto. And then in 2008, we had elections which brought into power a gentleman who was a spouse of uh, uh, late Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, about whom there was a consensus. In a divided country, there was a consensus about his uh, dubious record of financial integrity. And he was jailed, and then he was made... Uh, basically the president of Pakistan, which again created a lot of, uh, uh, I think, uh, disquiet and uh, about the mystique of democracy among the average people, I'm mentioning that. And I think we have not had this uh, a moment of epiphany, which is very much required, which I think they call the Damascus moment, St. Paul going to Damascus, sees Christ, and he has this moment that I'm on the wrong track and he changes his course. And, and I was very pleased to see uh, two days ago that there's a series they are showing. I suggest everybody should watch it being produced by National Geographic and uh, shown on ABC TV, eight part series called Genius MLK Martin Luther King slash Malcolm X. Malcolm X also had this moment of uh, epiphany that he started out as a radical person, uh, uh, separatist, exclusivist, went to Mecca, and he saw people black, brown, and yellow, all together in an egalitarian environment. So he came back, he said that he, this path of exclusion and this path of separatism is not working. It has to be inclusive, the message. And I think it was a great loss that uh, he had this, that. He was martyred, and he's, I think they'll be celebrating his 59th, not celebrating, marking his 59th uh, uh, anniversary of his assassination. He brought Muhammad Ali uh, into uh, uh, the fold of Islam, and there's something very interesting about America, which has to be a commendable as aspect. The capacity of America to self-correct. Muhammad Ali initially rejected, and my wife and I, Dana, we spent one full day with him, and he then realized that inclusivity works. You have to reach out. And he got the greatest non-state funeral. I think Pakistani culture at the, at, at, uh, the bottom, in the, at the grassroots, there's a tremendous thirst for fair play, of a level field, of merit, of treating the common man with the respect, of rejection of this quest for riches, which is, I think, the bane of the elite classes. So when you talk of democracy, sometimes it seems like plutocracy, the rule of the very few, or kleptocracy, the rule of the dishonest, or even autocracy, rule of a very aristocratic and dictatorial mindset, which is even amongst civilians, basically not necessarily among the military. And that is why there's been a revolver, revolving door. People are uh, demonized. First of all, when you're in chair, you're canonized as a hero, as a great person, as an answer to all our problems. The, but the moment the chair is taken away, the same people are then demonized. And that's why there's a very unfortunate, interesting pattern in Pakistan politics that no ruler, and this is a chilling statistic, has left gracefully. There's never been a, it's been an unsavory exit because they haven't learned the lessons. Most of them, they come, they think they are immune from the rules of the game. 
immune from the political dynamics. Nobody's going to touch us and we are invincible. And then they start making the same mistake, riches, launching their dynasty, trying to see how they can perpetuate themselves in power and being encircled. Imran was a very dear friend of mine and I knew him for, from 1977. We used to have long conversations. And I suggested the name of Insaf, which means fair play and justice. Because he was thinking of using the name Azadi, which is freedom. I said, use the word Insaf. That's more inclusive. Pakistan has attained its freedom. And I said that two things you have to avoid. And I gave him a book on that of a great Sufi saint, Nizamuddin Aliya. It was written by Professor uh, Bruce Lawrence, Duke University, great scholar of Islam and Middle East studies. And he, it's a, on the life of a great Muslim mystic, Nizamuddin Aliya. And Nizamuddin Aliya used to tell people 800 years ago, it's so important with whom you associate. Because your choice, not who, which family you come from, what is your education, what is your temperament, but your association, because that's by choice. Your relatives are not by choice. Your, your friends, your circle, whom you marry, whom you meet in the evening, you talk, have a cup of tea or drink, whatever you do, because they have a de determinative impact on the direction of your life and your destiny. So I said that two things you have to avoid. First of all, be very careful about whom you associate, so but, because they determine your priorities. They determine your direction. Although you think they are not going to do it. And secondly, harsh language. Avoid that. Because you have seen that currently in America, the damage done by harsh language, personalized language. And I feel sometimes when I listen to that, that this is either I'm sitting in Pakistan or I'm sitting in America. The language is the same, personal attacks now. And that is also very, very damaging because it affects the it affects the people hearing that, and they also indulge in. And then the your uh, personal disagreements become any animosities and become enemies, and you get you start basically on the pathway of revenge. I think when I was in uh, uh, and my own other thing, my advice to him was because he, as I mentioned, he was a superhero. He won the World Cup. And he was a philanthropist. He built Pakistan's first great uh, cancer hospital. My main uh, philosophical, uh, basically, was that please don't try to go after the chair. Try to make it into a social moment, a pressure moment, and you will retain your authority. Like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, in India, never sought a, basically a position of chair, nor did he want his family members to be a part of governments. So I was, he was suggesting to Imran that don't try to go for the chair. Because if you go after the chair, then you will make all the compromises which everybody else makes was in pursuit of the chair. You will associate with the same people. You will associate with big money. You will associate with unscrupulous people who want to cut corners and who want to get rich quick and who, who want to associate with power. And you will meet with the sameness. The same crowd, which has been in previous governments, wants to kept coming and rotating. The same thing continues. And But anyway, it happened. And Pakistan now is at the crossroads. Yes, they're going to, two, two, two days from now, there are going to be elections. And Dr. Akbar Ahmed mentioned about selections. Sometimes elections can be auctions. Who has the more money? not your intellect or your character or your or your personality or your intelligence, the pocket, who has deep pockets, which means in effect, under the hijab, under the camouflage of elections, you have dictatorship of the super rich, which means that you, it, it basically, it fulfills Einstein's theory of, uh, basically doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Now, what is different in Imran's situation is something what I think this thinker, significant thinker Nassim Talib said, a black swan event, something totally unexpected, totally unpredictable, which would have, would have a catastrophic events. The Pakistani military was hitherto immune from criticism, was not challenged, there was a consensus of respect around it. Now, 
Two things happened here in the, in the time of Imran, when Imran was unseated two years ago, that the Pakistani military in the eyes of, in the public eye, got a black eye. Never happened before. So that's a black swan event, basically. And secondly, and Dr. Akbar is familiar, he's a very esteemed civil servant, has been in different sectors of Pakistan policy making, that the military used to normally say when somebody was a civilian leader, that they used the word treason. He's a traitor. First time ever in Pakistan's history that the tables have been turned and some significant military figures were accused by Imran of being traitors and treason. So that's a black swan event, which has not happened before. And this could have, I think, consequences, unforeseeable events. I expect these elections, I don't think they are credible. Because if it is fair and free, it would lead very clearly, I'm saying that, to Imran winning. And today has been a big setback to the entire election process because the UN Commission on Human Rights, just about a couple of hours ago, they issued a statement questioning the legitimacy of Pakistani elections. I don't think they have ever done that before. And also questioning the pattern of har harassment of Imran's party. Again, that has not been done before. And Pakistan, uh, I think over 50% of the people are not literate. So symbols are very important. And Daud was saying for a symbol like black, for a blue, for the Demo De Democrats, red for the Republicans. Imran had picked the symbol of a cricket bat, like equivalent to a baseball bat, so that the most of the electorate, which may not be educated, can immediately say, I'm going to vote for the bat. That symbol has been taken away. And now people have no idea. It could be a pigeon, could be a sparrow, could be a squirrel could be a cooking stove. So people would be quite confused. So that's again to a detriment. It means that if the election, which is going to happen day after tomorrow, it may not be accepted in the public eye. Why well, you may want to comment on forcing Imran and his wife to divorce, imposing that decision in an unprecedented manner in jail. Yeah, they have also uh, basically, thank you, Dr. Akbar, they have also brought in his wife into the picture, which is not done in Pakistan normally. You don't drag a wife. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. And saying, questioning the lawfulness of the marriage because Imran married a woman, uh, Bushra, from Pakpatan. This is uh, one of the great, great uh, sites of one of the great saints, Baba Freed Ganshakar, and she was a spiritual healer and she divorced her husband and married uh, Imran. And now the first husband of uh, Imran's wife is, has gone to the court and questioned the lawfulness of the marriage. And, and the quickness of uh, the rulings itself, uh, I, think, I think it puts a huge question mark on the state of judiciary. And I'm quite surprised at the poor judgment which seems to be born out of panic. I think it would have been more sense not to have hold elections at this time than to holding something which is not going to be workable. And which, because in Pakistani conservative culture, you, you don't drag women, uh, despite the mistakes of the husband, into the courts and in the public dock. So, so there's been one mistake. First of all, let's not forget that the military had a big role in bringing Imran to power in 2018, which is also considered widely as managed engineer elections. And they were constantly talking of this mantra of the same page, an intellectually fraudulent concept. Because even within the family, you don't have a strange, uh, you don't have on the same page. And if everybody is on the same page, there will never be divorces in life, never. There will never be family estrangement, you know. So it's intellectually fraudulent. They were highlighting strange page. Well, it didn't work, basically. So I don't expect that Imran's, this punishment of his, this harassment of his, is going to be sustained. Ultimately, I think he will come out. They did this with Bhutto. Bhutto came back. They did this with Mujib. <laughs> and Mujib became the uh, leader of Bangladesh. They did this also with Zardari. Uh, Benazir's husband was called uh, former prime minister, female prime minister. As a, they used all kind of bad language, questioning his integrity. I don't even want to dignify the languages. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly they found out 
let's make it in the brain. They did it with Benazir also. She was also in custody. Again, they brought her. So this pattern is going to con continue. It's not a very sound reflection on those people who engineer it. It puts into question their judgment, their over-clever uh, scheming. And also it's a lesson. It's a lesson basically for the civilians that neither hug those at the helm, particularly the armed forces, nor alienate them. And sometimes they go too far in their over uh, clever schemings. I discovered basically a few things when I was in the government that few choices are very important. My administration played a very important role in few things. We came up with 1122, equivalent to 911, which was unthinkable in, the, in uh, Pakistan at that time, that when India didn't have this 911 service, nor did Bangladesh, nor did anybody in the subcontinent, which was a lifesaver. We came up with plans to encourage female education. So if a girl in a very poor village cannot afford going to a school, we said, take the girl to the school and we will give 200 rupees stipend. So if a person had three daughters, he would get 600 rupees. For, so this was even uh, emulated by <clears throat> the uh, World Bank also. This part was a great initiative. We encouraged basic health units, setting up health units everywhere. We also encouraged uh, initiatives, which I had a role, basically disability, 10% of the population, mostly in many countries are disabled, mental, physical, disability initiatives, giving dignity to senior citizens. I hosted at the chief minister's uh, uh, office, uh, I chaired that international conference on elevating the dignity of the teaching class. I said, if you want to add salience to teaching and education, you have to give respect to the teaching profession because the sacrifices they made. So these initiatives were, were very, very important. And I also took part in many uh, initiatives which Dr. Akbar has been doing tremendously, interfaith harmony, having forums, forums with Christians and uh, forums with Hindus, forum with, with uh, Sikhs also. In fact, Pakistan uh, just six months ago took, I think, one of the greatest peace initiatives in modern times that the Sikh faith was born in Pakistan, and that was in and the founder of the Sixth Faith was in 1469, and then he spent last 20 years in Kartarpur, small village next to where my ancestral village was. I went visited there, and and if Kartarpur, I'll give you it's an amazing thing. You see the door that is India, this is Pakistan. They would just walk through the door without visas. An enemy country existential threat and be received. And, and it was just breathtaking for me to see. And I received many of the Sikh pilgrims, many of the Hindus also, who revered uh, Guru Nanak. He spent his last 20 years there. Just received them. I addressed them also. And uh, I spoke to them. I said the legacy of uh, Baba Nanak. Again, the message of inclusivity. I said the legacy of the founder of the Sikh faith is basically Kirat uh, Karo, earn an honest livelihood. Naam Japo, take the name of the Lord. Thirdly, one Karo, share what you eat. And, and this was, I gave a speech, there was really a remarkable initiative taken by the Pakistani army. Nobody could have taken this initiative. An army which is entangled in an existential conflict with India, but yet at that moment, opening the doors called Kartarpur Corridor, it's one of the wonders of the world. The greatest, uh, basically, uh, break, break, greatest, I think, peace initiative of modern times. Also, I met, uh, talking from my personal experience, L.K. Advani. He is the architect founder of the Bharti Janta Party. Born in Karachi, 97 years, 97 not out. And he was the guy who said that this old ancient Babri Mosque, which is in Ayodhya, in India, that this was built on the site of the birthplace of the Hindu god, Lord Rama. So the people of India, Hindu majority country was whipped into a frenzy 
and this mosque was forcibly demolished. On that, they started, the Supreme Court validated that in India, and they started construction, and they said, we want to have a Hindu Vatican. And, and it was, I think, consecrated uh, a few years ago by the Indian Prime Minister. But when Advani came, then Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mr. Shujat, and then uh, my brother was Secretary General of the ruling party, Mushahid Hussain, and they said, why don't you come and go to Katas Raj? Katas Raj is in, in the Punjab where I come from, and uh, not that far from where I was born. And this is an ancient shrine of, to Lord Shiva. And he was stunned to see renovation work being done. So not everything has to be done tit for tat. The message of hate, the message of bigotry, the message of uh, exclusivity was met with a message of love and message of renovation and rejuvenation. And that melted him. This guy who actually despised Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder, founding father of Pakistan, such was the moment of epiphany. He goes right to uh, the mausoleum of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Qadi Azam in, in uh, Karachi. He says that he was a great man and a great leader. And al Dwani, who founded this party, which is now the ruling party of Mr. Narendra Modi, was ousted from his party because of that. So I think this is something very important. And during our times also, I note, I used to see that, and again, Mr. Shujad and Mr. Mushahid played a great role, that on pivotal moments like Christmas and Easter, the Muslim League offices were illuminated. Diwali, the Hindu festival of lights, again, they were illum illuminated. So what works basically is the message of in, 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 uh, inclusivity. Why do governments topple? I was studying that, and I said, I'm going to do a few things by own, my own choice. I decided, basically, that the house of my parental house, I did not take a minister's house, did not avail of any privileges. The same house, when I was a law student, small room with an attached bathroom upstairs in a modest dwelling in Lahore, I maintained that. My father was down, my mother was down, basically. My brother and his wife were living in in the another room, you know, I said, I'm going to basically, I'm not going to avail any perks. And people ask me that, why have you, are, why are you not living in the minister's colony? Why are you not there? Why are you not availing the perks? I said, if I live in a minister's colony amidst luxury, back of my mind, I will think I might lose that one day. And that will make me very cautious. That will deviate me from what I want to do. So that really liberated me, basically. And then I was very particular about a few things, about whom I choose to associate. I said, anything with financial implications, I decided to stay away from it, basically, completely. And if you look, and there's a gentleman there who's the president of the Pakistan Muslim League, Mr. Shahzad Chaudhary. Please stand up, Mr. Shahzad Chaudhary. I think very happy to see you. Welcome here. He knows that. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is the party which is going to likely to emerge. <clears throat> Why should we take some QA on no questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Come here then. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. So, any questions you want to ask from me or come up here to the mic? Uh, Mike, there on the left. I would I'll use my. Uh, there's, one on the there's one at this side on the other side. You see that mic over there? Yeah. Thank you. Good point. You've given us lots to think about. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Shah about uh, Indian-Pakistani relations and how the election might affect it. So the uh, Kosovar quarter, is that what it's called? That sort of helped with, I guess, a moment where maybe India and Pakistan would do something to move in the direction of peace. Um, how will this election affect Indian-Pakistani relations? Will it even affect it at all? Um, are Indian and Pakistani relations always destined to be extraordinarily hostile? Good or is there a way out? Good question. Good question. I think this election is unlikely to uh, produce stability. This is my own judgment about it, you know. And there's be a wide 
level of, I think, disquiet. And, and I don't think it's going to provide uh, political stability or economic security because acceptance is very important, uh, the perception of acceptance. And with the social media, it's very difficult to control. And there are two parallel parallels running in Pakistan. One is basically going with the status quo. Other is basically defiance. And people who historically politicians who have defied, they have basically uh, been popular. Like uh, uh, Bhutto had his image of defiance. He was popular. Benazir had the image of defiance. He was popular. Mr. Nawaz Sharif, when he was uh, uh, unjustly ousted uh, many, many years ago, he also chose to challenge it. And he also became a public figure. And... Uh, I think Imran's image right now is that, see, the, there's a youth bulge in Pakistan. He has a tremendous hold on the youth. And despite the uncles accepting the current system, the youth are not going to uh, accept it. I don't know how it's, how, how it's going to play in the army. So far, the army is very disciplined. But let's not forget, lots of retired officers were supporting Imran. So this system basically uh, is not going to be a stable system. And... Uh, I think that uh, don't expect any major breakthroughs in Indo-Pakistan ties because you have in power a prime minister of India who has no made no bones about his feelings on Hindu supremacy, basically. And when he was chief minister of the huge state of Gujarat, whose capital is Ahmedabad, there were murderous riots under his tutelage which led to his direct banishment from entering America for 10 years. Mr. Modi was not Taliban. He was not uh, Al-Qaeda. He was not ISIS. And, but the State Department had direct knowledge of his actual complicity. And now he's being embraced. And I think that that mistake is going to come and haunt America this thing, you know, basically. So I expect that just like in America, you're going to have a rocky ride uh, this election year, so would Pakistan. I feel, I now see a lot of parallels between the two. Thank you very much. What's your name, please? Uh, Jack. Jack, thank you, Jack, for that. Jack, so Jack. Uh, Jack. 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 Jack, it's also important to never lose from sight the fact that India did reduce Mahatma Gandhi the apostle of peace, literally, you know, there are all sorts of political opinions on him, but he is a symbol of peace and he was shot and killed because he advocated kindness and inclusivity to the Muslims. Okay. Now, in India, that symbol is marginalized. It's there, but it's not in the center. So you have a struggle there between his image and what's going on in India right now. Just one quick thing, you know, 1937, there was a great scholar, Muslim scholar, Alama Suhar Wardi. He wrote a book called Sayings of Prophet Muhammad. You know who wrote the foreword? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he said, I have one disagreement with Alama Suhar Wardi. He said, it's a treasure for the Muslims. He said, no, it's a treasure for the entire humanity. This so you see, you have figures like that. Mm -hmm. Now, those figures are really universal, as I said, those are universal figures. Okay. There's a statue of Gandhi here on Mass Ave. Okay. So, do not do not completely overlook the fact that they are there, and maybe maybe from within India you have a revival of that spirit that Gandhi represented. Gandhi and many others who thought along those lines. So it's going to be very interesting what the election will bring in India and what they'll bring in yeah. Pakistan. Yes, please. Uh, Stanley Cover was a brief allusion to international events and how they might uh, affect the election. But I'm more concerned about the more general impact of what's going on in the Middle East, because we're saying the bombing campaign will go on for weeks. So this could affect the political stability. What I have in mind in particular is what happened in 1979. Yeah. After the assault on the mosque, and you know what I'm talking about, a mob descended on our embassy. And obviously, as an American, I'm concerned about that. So I'm wondering if you could address the question 
of how a bombing campaign for weeks could affect the political situation within Pakistan. You need to use the microphone. Thank you very much. You said your first name is Stanley, right? Right. Yeah. Very pertinent question. I think uh, these things have happened in the past also. In 1956, there was a crisis, which also had a, a put tremendous pressure on the government. And in uh, 1979, um, Stanley, you mentioned, that was the 14th centennial of Islam, November 21, 1979. I wrote an article in the Washington Post along with George Ball. So that's why I remember that date. A very good question. That uh, there was a false rumor that uh, there was a assault on the on Mecca. And there was a false rumor generated that Americans were, were involved, which led to the storming of the US embassy and there was a great tragedy. In uh, 1989, there was another also uh, a crisis uh, which happened when, about the Salman Rushdie book, which happened also, which uh, affected the thing. In 1990, when uh, Pakistan decided to uh, support Desert Storm, and such was the pressure generated that uh, it broke the consensus between the civilian government, which was ostensibly in support of the Desert Storm, and the military, which was also supporting it. But the pressure on the street was so much that General Aslam Beg, who was then the army chief, took a position contrary to the Pakistani position and condemned uh, Desert Storm. So this question, this could be potentially, I mentioned about Black Swan. If there's a, a, a turmoil in Pakistan, if there's instability generated by the elections and the environment around that, because Pakistan is basically a Muslim country and also has the pan-Islamic sentiments. It could have an impact which is unfo unforeseen. So your question is excellent. What I don't know is and what I don't, uh, I think, I can tell very clearly whether the people at the helm, decision makers, are they sensitive to it or not? I think they should be very, very sensitive to it. That if there's a confluence of rising instability in the Middle East, in the conflagration there, with uh, chaos and poor governance in Pakistan because the inflation is very high. Law and order is quite suspect. Ethno-nationalism is on the rise also. And there's a lot of uh, uh, tumult. There's a sectarian element also is there. There's provincialism is there. On top of that, if this comes, you know, I think uh, this would be a major, major headache uh, for the, whoever is sitting in the chair. So excellent question. Hello. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, both of you for uh, being here today. Um, so uh, I'm uh, somebody who's uh, very um, passionate about defending democracy, but uh, I want to understand uh, just uh, from both of your perspectives, uh, what special things uh, do we have to do as ordinary citizens to defend our democ to defend democracy, like whether that be in the United States or uh, Pakistan or any other country in the world. Um, it was, uh, I forget who, but uh, one of you mentioned that uh, Pakistan was under martial law for the majority of its existence. Um, in the United States, uh, we can't really uh, sympathize with that. Um, uh, our democracy is is the oldest uh, and longest lasting in the, in the history of the world. And uh, it's almost seen as this guaranteed inevitability that um, even if we're going that even if we're going to have a rocky election, that uh, American democracy is so successful that ordinary people don't need to do anything. Uh, it's just going to correct itself. It's like the tap water is going like why like where does the tap water come from? It's just always there. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking is um, like a. Uh, what uh, does the or what do ordinary people uh, need to do? Uh, what do ordinary people need to uh, buy into? And what do ordinary people uh, have to believe and I guess implement in order to defend democracy? Thank you. Uh, what was your name again? Oh, uh, Connor. Connor. Connor, thank you for that excellent question. 
Uh, I, after 9-11, I joined the university, so I had to attend many seminars, lectures on precisely America and the Muslim world, not just Pakistan. And one of the questions that kept coming up again and again was precisely this, what should we be doing? What should they be doing? And you're asking the same question, uh, what should Pakistanis be doing and what should we be doing in terms of uh, helping Pakistan towards democracy? And I thought a lot about it, Connor, and this is my answer. And I'd like to hear Mohit's answer also. My answer is this, Connor. I went to a college in Pakistan established in Lahore called Foreman Christian College, which is now a university. Now mark this carefully. It was founded by a Christian missionary called Foreman decades ago, in fact, in the 19th century. So Foreman Christian College, a Christian college in the heart of Pakistan, which is not a theological college, it's a regular uh, college now, university, has produced, apart from both of us, some of the most distinguished Pakistanis you can think of, presidents, prime ministers, hundreds of members of parliament. And I don't think any of them would want either extremism or violence. And I thought to myself, here's something where, Amer and the American, American teachers, wonderful teachers, they were like, literally like fathers, although they weren't uh, priests, but they were like fathers to us, very warm, very affectionate, very supportive, constantly helping students to come to America and so on, on the one hand. On the other hand, you have America in terms of foreign policy saying, how do we influence Pakistan or countries in that region? And pouring in money by giving military aid, missiles, tanks, planes, and all of that, Connor, mm -hmm. came to naught when you saw those terrible images, heartbreaking images of those military planes trundling down the runway in Kabul just recently. At the end of 20 years of that policy. So you had trillions of dollars, thousands of lives, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives ending in that runway, which re was reminiscent of Saigon and the helicopters taking off in Saigon. Now compare that to form and Christian college. As far as I know, why then you can correct me if I'm wrong, no suicide bombs on campus, in spite of the violence which you often hear from Pakistan, there's never been a suicide bomber or any chaos in because Pakistanis appreciate the education they are being given by the Americans. So the Americans are safe. They, they, most of them live on campus or near campus. They play tennis. They interact with Pakistani students. And Pakistani students who study there very proudly wear that identity on their um, um, blazers, on their, on their, as, as a badge of honor. So think to yourself, Connor, if you are the Secretary of State tomorrow, and I hope you will carry on and become something in government because you're a thoughtful young man. Ask yourself this question. I am an American. I give billions of dollars. What am I getting in return? After 20 years in Afghanistan, would you be able to walk around in Kabul and say I'm an American? You won't. You won't be safe. So ask yourself, am I safer there? Or if you were in Foreman Christian College and walked about on campus, people would welcome you. So what has your investment given you? I would say education, education, education. And I'm not just speaking as an educationist, as a professor on campus. I'm trying to be very realistic in terms of real politik. In terms of real politik, you have to ask yourself these hard questions. And not only you, it's the those governments who are involved in giving aid or trying to influence and impress other governments. It's critical they ask this question. Otherwise, as far as I see it, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe history will prove me wrong, but a ceaseless sense of violence and more violence and more violence will only generate more violence and more violence. But education, colleges, universities will give you generations of people who will look up to you as friends, as benefactors. I would have had a string of these foreman Christian type, type universities, not necessarily with the same name, maybe with different names, right along the borders between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I would have a string of them throughout Afghanistan. An entire generation, by now you'd have been producing scholars who would have, who would have grown up reading uh, 
Shakespeare and reading all the great works of the West and appreciating it and being uh, up to date with Taylor Swift and all the controversies that I'm just showing Connor that I'm up to date with the culture. <laughs> so, I hope you appreciate that, Connor. Uh, and don't worry, I'm going to be remembering all of this uh, just in case tomorrow I do wake up as the Secretary <laughs> of State. Don't give up your dream, Connor. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. I'll make a note. <laughs> I think uh, one thing the young people can challenge is the crushing influence of big money, which is a threat to democracy. Regrettably, the Supreme Court ratified that in the Citizens United uh, ruling. And Jack, you're a smart young man. You know about it, yes. So that is one thing to question, because under the camouflage and garb of democracy, the power is concentrated in the hands of the very few. Secondly, questioning, questioning of the official script handed by the editors, by the establishment. That is so important, which has been seen and which has been evident right now in America, right now, everywhere there's been questioning, which is a very hopeful sign. This was the questioning which led to the demolition of apartheid. And uh, Remember that uh, F.W.D. Clerk, who was the president of South Africa, came from an apartheid family, Afrikaner. And he eventually, the pressure was such, and my former law partner, Senator James Abu has passed away, great man. He agitated, also got arrested in front of the South African embassy, protesting against apartheid now. And he gave a speech at the South African parliament, uh, F.W.D. Clerk, whom I respect. He said, South Africa is heading for a certain bloodshed, but it can be avoided because he saw that as a man-made problem, not a God-made problem, like a calamity like earthquake. He said it can be prevented. You have to do two things, release Mandela and dismantle apartheid. He did so and he saved South Africa from basically a partition. Uh, and a bloodbath blood also. Dr. Akbar mentioned about FC College. The motto of FC College is by love serve one another. And when I'm in Pakistan, in Lahore, I go to Jail Road. This is called a European Cemetery, Kora Kabristan. And most of my American faculty are buried there, resting there. But one common thing I see there, on their tombstone, on the epitaph, is written the parting canon of St. Paul. He said, I stayed on course, I kept on faith, kept my faith, and I fought the good fight. That is what needs to be done by the young people. That education is very good, but what use education when it, the anxieties and insecurities and irrational fears are still there? I've seen many educated people, when the moment of truth comes, somehow they, they're built and their body language changes, basically. I've seen many people, educated people from Pakistan, who are tigers at home, but when they go abroad in the West, they become turkeys. So I think it's so important to instill a sense of confidence, a sense of faith, and the ability. My father, when he was passing away, and uh, I, he was mentally very clear, I asked him, what is your parting advice for us? He was a dervish, a mystic. He says two things. Risk a halal, earn honest livelihood, and call my haq. Speak truth to power. I think that's a parting thing. Fight the good fight. Thank you. Good advice. Yes, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Jeff Wheeler, and I uh, direct a project on um, reducing child labor and forced labor in global supply chains through traceability. And we're doing a pilot in Pakistan on cotton, funded by the U.S. Department of Labor. Just a few quick questions. One is, <clears throat> I'm supposed to be in Lahore in a couple of weeks. And I'm wondering what, um, how safe is this going to be? Is it going to erupt into protests and violence? And I think uh, a related question is the re relationship between the provincial governments and the federal government since the devolution of power to the provincial level. And PTI is very strong in the Punjab, but I wonder how that's going to roll out in the tension between the provincial government and the national government with so much power at the provincial level. Then a, a final question, which is, how is the U.S. perceived in the Pakistan in this role? I know Imran Khan had made some comments of, that he thought the U.S. government was partly behind him being overthrown. 
but I'm wondering what the popular per perception is of the U.S. in uh, in the, the steps that are being uh, taken by the government. Thank you. I hear from the heart. Your name reminds me Wheeler, or one of the great benefactors of Pakistan, Dr. Mort, great, I think probably the greatest archaeologist of the 20th century, Dr. Martin Mortimer Wheeler. And he was the guy who excavated the what is the called the cradle of Indus civilization, Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, and Texala. And in 1950, he wrote a book called 5,000 Years of Pakistan's Heritage. You, I think if you're in Lahore, Lahore is extremely warm-hearted and hospitable. Yes. And even the, one of the greatest writers of the subcontinent, a Sikh, Hush, uh, one Sikh, he says that the Punjab Muslims, he said that, they are the most hospitable and warm-hearted people. So you'll be quite stunned. There's a tremendous respect for the guests. When India team came during time of tensions to play cricket in Pakistan in 2004, they were received with gusto, warmth, hospitality. Indian flags were waved all over Pakistan, all over Lahore. And when they used to go to Lahore shops to shop, shopkeepers refused. I was in the government then, you know, and I was I attended many of the matches as the chief guest there. So they were received with a lot of love and affections. So don't worry. Yes, I think there will be tension. It's a, it's going to be a fragile setup. And there will be tensions all over. I think it will be a general instability. And uh, because it's replacing one, somehow the message sometimes will comes across that it is basically replacing uh, the, the deposed government of Imran with the government which was deposed of Nawaz Sharif with Nawaz Sharif. So that will be, I think, an inherent instability. But insofar as Imran is concerned, I think some record has to be put clearly. He came to meet Trump. Trump had banned most, and he had a meeting with uh, Trump at the White House. He did not criticize. He could have had the chance to speak. Huck said it. Why are you imposing travel ban on Muslims? Not a word came uh, from him of protest on that, no, number one. I think sometimes you judge people by actions, not by words and claims. And I'm talking to him as his friend and colleague. And I've, what I've been saying to him, he knows it. I've said it to his face. I've never gone on TV, never written. I'm a writer. I never have written about him because so much of the information is is passed on in confidentiality. And it's, I think, a breach of trust. So I'll mention something which is very public. When he comes back to Pakistan after a one-hour meeting, he says, I feel I've just won the World Cup. And I was a bit surprised that a meeting with Trump in the White House is equivalent to winning a World Cup. And thirdly, uh, that when he goes back, he appoints his national security advisor from the United States Institute of Peace, which is a pillar of the US establishment. So what you see and what you act, you have to take a decision. Are you judge people by actions or by their, by their words? So you uh, uh, you have a you have a very blessed name in Pakistan. So I think you will have a great time. Enjoy the restaurants. Enjoy the people. Enjoy the signs the people. signs are good, but at the same time, I would wait for the results and what happens afterwards, because right now there is no overt anti-Americanism, but in Pakistan it is there in a subterranean level. So you need to just watch it. May erupt into one direction or another direction. So far, as Moet said, the signs are not really there. So that's, for us, it's good in the context of your going back. Uh, but again, watch for the results, see what happens afterwards. Is there a political crisis? Is that crisis veering into anti-Americanism or is it internal? Is it the establishment versus the military or the military versus the political parties, the role of the, uh, uh, the party of Imran Khan and so on? And um, uh, it's a situation of wait and see, which neither I nor Moet can predict right now. And people in, in Pakistan, Lahore have been wonderful to me. I, I was last there during the uh, mango season, so that's great. It's just there may be. And there are there are Mr. Vila, uh, whoever I've met who's been to I've been. I took my uh, young students from American University. There's uh, students who who uh, regular students, undergrads. Uh, to Pakistan, and we not only uh, had tea with Benazir Bhutto, we had 
lunch with the former prime minister in the chief minister's house. And my students were, and we met the president and they were just amazed. They said, this kind of hospitality is unimaginable. These are young students, uh, young American students. And then at the height of the lunch, which was very cordial in the chief minister's house with all the Mughal paintings, some official men came in carrying carpets. And each one of the students was given a carpet. And they were just overwhelmed with the warmth and hospitality. So Pakistanis are very hospitable. And you can expect that. But remember, there are larger forces at play. And it would be, I think, um, an oversight, certainly on my part, not to point to them in your case. So enjoy your trip. And I hope you go there, have a wonderful trip, and give us a report back. Uh, hi, thanks for being with us today. It was a very insightful information that we got. Uh, my name is Atifa, and I'm studying um, international peace and security. Uh, sorry, what's your name, please? Atifa. Asifa. Atifa. Asifa, mashallah. Yeah. Um, so my question is very much related on the issue. You you spoke about the Afghanistan relations and the things changed, changed there as well. So I wanted to get a perspective, just like the way we got about India. What both of you think about how would the result of the election uh, affect the Pakistan-Afghanistan relationship? Because what I, um, as a student of uh, peace and conflict, have uh, recently seen was the immigration issue, because uh, when the issues got very hard in Pakistan, one of the main effects it put was in terms of immigration in the Afghan immigrations. Lots of the refugees in there, they have been pushed back to Afghanistan. And now I'm afraid like with the current crisis of the election, how much does it affect the people to people relationship? And how much would it affect into the political relationship? You know, there's like, these visa issues and migrations may be very small, but on larger scale, are we expecting something big, or would we would we get a more friendlier uh, relationship between the two of them? But uh, otherwise, like I have traveled to Pakistan and it has been a great destination for me, and I do expect to go, but I haven't been issued a visa yet. It's like oh. five months. <laughs> thank you, yeah. thank you so much for that uh, excellent question and complex question. And uh, I know that uh, our distinguished speaker will want to comment on this. I do want to respond to you and also point out that uh, Alice has uh, indicated that we are running out of time so that we will end punctually. And uh, there's a joke among Pakistanis. Pakistanis have a great sense of humor, Mr. Vela, as you'll, as you'll uh, admit. And they are very, very much self-critical. And one of their jokes is that they're always not punctual, so they 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 have a, a very a happy disregard for time and punctuality. So we will challenge that and be punctual and end at one o'clock. And Alice, I expect you to give me a wave. So in response to um, Pakistan's attitude to India, both of us are very committed to peace. Both of us want stability in the region, and you cannot have stability between two nuclear powers constantly confronting each other and threatening each other, their ministers and their generals who are constantly talking about using the nuclear option. And I think both, both leaders or sets of leaders on both sides have to pull back and behave with much more maturity and much more compassion. These are the virtues of any leader and those have been missing in, uh, in absence uh, in terms of the relationship. So we hope, we hope, that good sense will prevail. It's difficult to see because you'll have the elections coming, there'll be heated comments on the other side. And in Pakistan itself, there's some faint hope that if one party comes, it may encourage dialogue with India. Uh, Imran Khan's party, if it comes in and if he's in uh, charge of the party, they may take a different position with India and hopefully open up. And don't forget that Kartarpur, which uh, Mohit pointed out, that historic development was also taken, undertaken by Pakistan to create a better relationship with India. And we need to see much more of this. Right now, you're talking about visas. It's so difficult for ordinary citizens on both sides to get a visa. Just literally, it drives individuals crazy, and that's not how government should behave because there, these people are going across the border to meet relatives or to visit cultural sites or religious sites. So again, 
No one can predict how this is going to go. You'll have to wait for the Pakistan elections and who takes over. And much more important, because India is the bigger country, you'll have to wait and see how the elections take shape in India, where the signs already are rather discouraging because uh, all the speeches being given, the media, which is constantly talking about Pakistan. And I was uh, disappointed to see a new major movie made in India called Fighter. Have you heard about the movie? Well, it's a big budget, super budget, and it's got one of the top stars, and I'm a big fan of his, Hitak Roshan, you know, who uh, was, who played, uh, he played Akbar, didn't he, in uh, Joda? His father, his grandfather was a great musician born in Gujarat. There you are. Yeah. That means he was a Pakistani. Why <laughs> <laughs> knows all the, <laughs> the genealogy of these great actors. So he plays the Tom Cruise character in Top Gun. So he's a pilot, he's, you know, he's got all this swagger and he walks about and there's music. And again, Bollywood makes some great films and we enjoy them. But in this film, the entire film is about the Indian Air Force attacking Pakistan. And Pakistan, the enemy, Pakistan has done something. So I'm asking myself, you've got the elections coming up and just before the elections, you have a major movie, which is going to be seen by millions of people pumping the idea that that is the enemy and the nuclear war is inevitable. So I'm also very apprehensive of this and personally, intellectually, spiritually, I'm completely against this trend towards confrontation, which could lead one slip and it could lead us to a devastating catastrophe, which will not only destroy India and Pakistan, but the planet itself. And on that, Happy note, Alice, we are going to end after Moids. Afghanistan, we hope we have better relations. I think you asked a very good question about Afghanistan. Did you watch the match Pakistan versus Afghanistan at the World Cup? Ibrahim Zadran, a great player. When Akbar, he is, uh, made the man of the match, was a heroic victory of Afghanistan over Pakistan. And this game was developed by Afghan refugees in Pakistan. It's a phenomenal. The only non-commonwealth country which has test status. He said, I dedicate my win to those Afghans who have been expelled from Pakistan. I think it was a very poorly thought out gesture, the expulsion of the Afghans, inhumane and antithetical to the values of Islam of giving sanctuary. And of Pakistan. Pakistan is going to be very generous. With very them. generous. And it was a very, very uh, bad move. So I think this will further augment distrust. And taken in the, under the aegis of a caretaker government, they were not supposed to take such a consequential decision. Now the government which comes to power, whosoever comes to power, will have to live with the consequences. So I don't expect uh, any strong feelings of amity emerging from Kabul, at least. But uh, here, Mohid, we should mention that uh, Imran Khan's cultural background, if not uh, uh, political, has links with the old KP province, or the old frontier province. And he has uh, an affinity with the Pashtun uh, communities who support him. There's a very, very steady support. Uh, so if he comes in and if he decides to move towards better relations with Afghanistan, that is one ray of light in this context. Because I completely agree with Mohaid, pushing these poor, helpless Afghans across the border at this time during winter, it was heartbreaking. And how Pakistan could do it, I was just baffled and how they could pull it off. Now, I want to end this uh, fascinating session that we've had. I would like to thank Dr. Mohit Shah. Yeah, he'll say I'm not a doctor, but for all practical purposes, I think Mohit, you're more than a doctor, so thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, the Dean for launching this session and uh, gracing us with her presence. And I'd like to thank Alice, who's been absolutely amazing in being uh, punctilious, efficient, impeccable in our organization. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you.